Facts and Algebra 2, Lesson 94. Hi students, we are going to talk today about functions. This is mostly review of something that we've covered in past years. For sure we did it last year in almost exactly the same level of detail. So I'm not throwing you into any kind of briar patch that you haven't already been in. Gosh, that's comforting, isn't it? Um, but here's the thing about functions. They're really nothing new. These are all ideas that we've been using all along. We did not give them a fancy name and we gave them a different kind of notation. And you've been doing this all the way along. And what always happens to students is that we come along, we use some weird vocabulary and we slap some different symbols on the page and people freak out because it looks like something new, but it's not. The calculations are exactly the same. So please don't let this freak you out. Do you remember back when we first started graphing lines and we would get something like, oh, let's see, y equals 2x minus 3. And we, we didn't know yet about slope and y-intercept. So in order to graph this, we would make a chart. Do you remember this? I hate this and I got you out of it really fast. But we did it like this. Where we would say, okay, choose anything you want to be the x, plug it in and solve, and then that answer is your y value, right? We did that. Um, let's do it again just for practice. Let's choose one as one of our numbers. Then we'd multiply two times one minus three. That's two minus three, that's minus one, right? And then we'd choose another easy one. Let's choose zero. 2 times 0 minus 3, that becomes 0. This is minus 3. And then let's make, let's just choose positive 2. 2 times 2 minus 3 would give us positive 1, right? That was just a little chart that we made. And then we would graph these pairs of points, right? We would graph 1 and negative 1. And we would graph 0 and negative 3. And we would graph 2 and 1. This is all that a function is. We can call this a function. And we call this x, we call the independent variable. That sounds really fancy, but if you think about it, independent means we can choose whatever we want to plug in there. And that's exactly what we did, right? There was, no, there was no right or wrong number to choose. I could have put in 57 and negative 124. It would have been fine. We could have calculated the right answer. I just chose little numbers because they're easier. This side, though, is called the dependent variable because we didn't really have any choice in this, right? Once we chose the x, then we ran it through, and this is the answer that came out. We didn't get to choose that. It had to come out to that number based on the calculation. So this one was dependent. It depended on this calculation for its value. Um, we were choosing these, so another thing we call these is the domain. Those are the numbers that we can choose. The ones that come out, the, the solutions, if you will, we call those the range. Okay, um, this is the vocabulary that I'm talking about. It's nothing difficult, but it's just another way to look at it. Now, you would agree to me with me that every time we plug one into this function, we are always gonna get minus one. It's never gonna come out to a different answer, correct? Same for zero, same for two, same for any number we could choose as the independent variable. If we do our calculations correctly, we will always get the same value for y associated with that particular x. That, is, that pairing is one word for it, or one-on-one -on -one matching, or another word that is very poetic, I think, it's called mirroring. 
That relationship that whenever we put in this, we'll always get that. These are all words that describe that. Those are very important and unique features of a function. And we also get another word for it is a set of ordered pairs. Okay, so we understand this intuitively. These are just some of the words that we use that describes this very specific characteristic of functions that we get this unique pairing of numbers. All right. Uh, another way we can illustrate this, it's very similar to this, is to draw circles. This is a picture of the domain. One, zero, two. This is a picture of the range. Minus one, minus three, positive one. Notice I'm just taking these values. And we can draw it like this. And we're just describing all of these words again. There's this pairing, this one-on-one -on -one matching, this mirroring, this set of ordered pairs that comes from when we connect the domain and the range. That's what DNR stands for. Okay. Now, John will... throw letters in sometimes. I've got all numbers here, but he throws letters in sometimes. That's okay. We can do it that way. All of those things are true. So the definition of a function is an equation that has only one answer for y for any value of x. That's so obvious and basic that it almost hurts our brains to consider it. Yeah, whenever you plug in x, you're gonna get a specific y. You're not gonna get a different one. Yeah, that's all a function is, okay? A function is a mapping between the two sets. That's another word we can use here. Often this word mapping is identified with this uh, way of presenting the thing. The domain, um, sometimes the range is called the image because it's like the, what you get when you look in the mirror. Um, I'm just looking through all of John's long thing to make sure we're touching on all the important parts. The image, the range, um, the domain must be specified or implied. Ours is very specific, right? A way must be designated to find every image or answer, yep. And there must be exactly one image for every member of the domain. Okay, so this has to point to only one answer. And let's look at some examples. I'm going to draw them. They're in the book. In example 94.1, John gives us some of those mapping style images. And he asks us if they're functions or if they're not functions. Here's the first one. We have two items in our domain, and they both point to the same number in our range. Could that be a function? Yes, because there's only one answer. For, for each x, we only have one y. There's a clear mapping. Um, and it could be, that could be the function. No matter what you put in, y is always equal to three. This is legitimate, right? So this is A, so this is yes, a function. A simple one, a somewhat weird one, but it's a function. B. Now check out these arrows. Okay. Seven is paired with three. Okay, that looks really good. But what's going on with five here? Five is paired with three and five is paired with four. That is a problem because if you're putting five into some function, you should always get the same answer, right? So whatever's going on here, no, this is not a function. Because five has two images. No bueno. That's what killed it right there. Okay? Let's look at C. 
there are, this goes up through D. Check this out. Okay, four is paired with five. Six is paired with seven. Okay, that looks cool. M, which is fine. You can have a, a letter as an input, but it does not have any sort of image. It's paired. Um, there's no image for M. So that's a deal breaker. This is not a function. And then D, this one's different and it looks weird. I'm using the hashtag as an abbreviation for the word numbers, which is what it used to be. So that says real numbers. And then we're given this. Now this does not look like any of our other pictures, but could we use this information to create a range? Because the range is blank right now. We, the real numbers are what we choose from. And then we see this function, x plus two equals y. Could we use this to create a set of ordered pairs, a set of mirrored images. Yes, we could. We could We could take this information, plug these all in for x, add two to each value and get a corresponding y. Yes, this is a function. It is a different presentation than we have seen in the other examples, but it works. We could use this information to create a beautiful little function. Okay, now John is going to give us a similar kind of problem. Only he's going to present the information in a different way. Going back to this, we saw that this style looks just like this, right? We took these numbers and wrote them in bubbles, and then we drew this corresponding. But we also can look at the numbers this way, right? Instead of putting them in separate bubbles, we can put the pairs together. And what we would be looking for in this is that every time we see the same number come up in the X spot, we should see the, a matching Y, right? So it's okay, okay, one's with minus one, but if we then later in the list saw one is with five, for example, that would be a deal breaker. One has to always be paired with minus one. So for this next set of problems, let me just show you in the book. It's easier than rewriting everything. Can you see here? We'll just use this. So there's the list of ordered pairs. John's just changed the way he's presenting these numbers. And so what I'm doing is I'm checking to see that every time a number shows up in X, if it ever repeats in another set of ordered pairs, it's got the same Y with it. So there's a four, there's a seven, there's a minus three, and there's a minus six. None of the X's repeat. So I don't care what the Y's do. They can do whatever they want. A is a function, yes. B, let's look at this one, four, five, seven, six. I'm looking just at the X values because if they don't repeat, then it doesn't, I don't care what the Y's are. So this one looks like a function too. What about C? Five, four, seven, five. All right, I said five twice. In the first one, five is paired with minus two. In the second one, five is paired with four. Uh-uh, no, that's a deal breaker. Five needs to be with the same number every time. So C is not a function. And then what about D? Seven, three, six, four. That one is a function. A, B, and D are functions. C is not because five has two images. Yay, we nailed it, right? Okay. And then that's, that's the basic information about what functions are and how we can examine them and how we can... Um, tell if they're actually legitimate functions or not. And now we're going to talk ever so briefly about what we call functional notation. And that means we're going to use just a slight few different symbols
to lay out exactly the same kind of problems that we've done um, and get comfortable with that again. If the h of x equals I'm just copying the problem information down. Okay, John has given us two functions. He's told us that we have something called the h of x, which is 4x minus 3. Now notice that normally we would call that y on the left-hand side, right? But instead, John is saying this is a function, the independent variable is x, and we're naming it h, okay? Here he says here's another function. Again, we're using the independent variable of x, but this time we're naming it p. This is very useful when you have a big problem that has lots of different equations going on. You can name them h and p, and it allows you to talk about them and plug different values in as you work on the overall problem, right? This is, this is part of a bigger picture. So in this case, John gives us these two functions. We call them functions, not equations. Same difference. And he tells us to find the p of minus 3. What this means is go to the p function, the p function, go to the p function and plug in plug minus 3 in 4x, because normally we had an x there, right? So when we write a minus 3 in there, that means put minus 3 in wherever there's an x. So that means we don't need this h function at all in this problem. That was just a red herring thrown across our path. So we write the p of minus 3 equals, oh, I'm sorry, I wrote that wrong. The p of minus 3, the parentheses should just be around the number. Uh, the p of minus 3 equals, and now I bucket it, right? I take this expression, and I write it here with buckets for the x's, and I pour the minus 3 in where the x's go. We've been doing this forever, right? We just never called it a function problem, and we didn't call it a p of x or an h of x. We just said y equals, and we solved it. This is the very same thing. Okay. Minus three quantity squared is positive nine because I cannot cover that up, so it turns positive. This, however, becomes also positive nine, right? Three times three is nine, and then two minuses make a plus. And so we find that the P of minus three equals 18. Tell me that wasn't super easy. That's super easy, right? It's just figuring out what this P business means. Okay, that's all there is to lesson 94. I hope you remember it. I hope you are completely in command of this and feel strong and secure in your knowledge of functional expressions. Yay, goodbye.